Hello, I'm Lynn Nottage, and I'm one of the Lilies who's been dedicated to promoting the work of women in theater. For the past six years, we have focused our attention on raising the numbers of women of color employed in professional theater. This effort is culminating with the Lorraine Hansberry Initiative, a bronze sculpture by Alison Saar that will tour the nation, as well as the creation of a unique scholarship to support the cost of living expenses for female and non-binary dramatic writers of color attending graduate school. We Lilies are thrilled to have partnered with the New Victory Theatre and the 24-hour plays on this edition to the tapestry of New York City's young artistic voices. The New Victory, inspired by Lorraine's writing and activism, has worked with students to develop their own dramatic pieces. 53 students submitted and eight were selected to work with professional directors and actors to realize their vision. In 1964, Lorraine Hansberry gave a speech to the winners of the Reader's Digest United Negro College Fund Writing Contest. In it, she gave some of the best advice a young writer could ever hear. She said, write if you will, but write about the world as it is and as you think it ought to be and must be if there is to be a world. Write about all the things that men have written about since the beginning of writing and talking, but write to the point. Work hard at it. Care about it. Write about our people. Tell their story. You have something glorious to draw on, begging for attention. Don't pass it up. Use it. Good luck to you. The nation needs your gifts. What, what made you write this piece? Was it a picture? Was it a, an assignment? You know, just we want to know how this came to be. It was really cool because there was all these photos from like different periods in time. And I found one of um, this march in a snow, a women's rights march. If I were to think outside the box, who could I choose? And so I chose a snowflake. First of all, I don't really see anybody that looks like me. At most, I think I have five people, like black people that um, are in my grade. And in my stories and systems class where I wrote this, I think I was the only black girl in the class. It's a shared connection that most black girls feel like being like excluded or being alone or feeling like there's something wrong with them. You have stuff that pe other people don't have. Most of my monologue is in the past tense. They're speaking to a large audience because they're a young activist and they're, I guess a lot of people are like, oh, how did you start out? And they're sharing that story. I kind of wanted to like include the uh, things people have said to me, what people and kids my age have just heard in general. A lot of us hear it from like our own family members and our mothers who want us to stay safe. And like they, they're obviously saying it with good intent, but it's still kind of like unsettling to hear. They're kind of emotional and they're worried, but it's kind of okay for them. They feel like a mixed emotions. I don't really want everyone to be sad when they're kind of watching it. I kind of want it to be some laughter, but not really that much because there's a lesson to learn. Does anything change when she's in front of people saying these words out loud? Has she ever said this before? She probably intended to say very little. Talking kind of just let her release a lot of stuff. Is the world an unfair place? What out of what I've just either said or who I'm talking to is motivating that question in that moment. What you were saying with like him sort of in a dark, bleak way, um, I, I like that. I think that's a good idea for when talking to these white people. I am so blown away by your use of punctuation, Lila. It's the candy to an actor because you provide a roadmap of where to pause and where the rhythms are. When Annie and I do film it, is it just me talking? Is there a chance it could be just images? It might be nice um, to show the photo that um, I chose as inspiration, maybe at the beginning or the end or somewhere in there. It's a really <laughs> good representation. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just working with some fresh stuff. I thought that was really good. Like I thought, it, it just gets better and better each time. You really um, embodied it and kind of got into the role of the people asking the questions. With, so when you're like, oh, your hair's so exotic, can you, can I touch it? It was like, it was like somebody else was saying it. I, I can definitely make a distinction between 
you know, your voice, my voice, and then people out in the world that are trying to push me into a corner. I'm supposed to prepare myself to take on these tasks, which has to happen in the world that you told me I can't go out in and I shouldn't go out in. How am I supposed to become anything? What the line was, um, but what if there's no story at all? I was also thinking about how much of it she's actually verbally speaking and how much of it she's kind of thinking. Maybe this is just what she wants to say and she's almost working up the courage to say this. Something I, I just realized is that the line art sending a message that no human could, it doesn't really make sense now because humans are the ones making the art that no one could put into words or something like that it would make more sense. The most exciting part of a, of a creative process is to come with questions and, and not the answers because that way there's an invitation for everyone in the room to find the answers together. Dear generations before me, you gave the world to us for saving. You didn't tell us what we were supposed to save. You didn't tell us how we were supposed to save it. You treat us like we're less than you. Are you threatened by my woke presence? Do you feel scared when I walk into the room? Do you look at me and think I'm presenting myself in a way that is unsuitable to you? Maybe you think all those things and more, and that's okay, but why do you choose to share that with me? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. It doesn't just apply when you're at the dinner party and the food tastes bad. It applies when your neighbor calls you jailbait because of what you're wearing. It applies when you see me on the street and you say obscene things. It applies when, when you're a college student screaming at seventh graders to pull their masks down so you could see what their face looks like. Oh, it's for your protection. I just want you to stay safe. You're not the issue, it's them. So if I'm not the issue, then why are you telling me to change? How do you expect me to grow when you act like I don't understand the hushed whispers you speak in? I hear the way you talk about my generation, <laughs> the way we act how inappropriate and, and too bold when we speak. That the message that we spread is only gonna hurt ourselves. I think about my peers, the ones who are no longer with us today, gone from violence they couldn't control. What message did they send before leaving this earth? What message did they want to share with the world? What message was taken from them along with their life? I have been told time and time again that it's up to our generation to change the world. How are we supposed to change anything if we're being told it's not safe for us to go out into the world? You've created ruins where mountains used to exist. We can't build back mountains with our concrete and hands. We can't even go outside without worrying, will I, I be the next headline? And what if I am? Will people care? Will I ever be found? What will happen to my memory and, and, and who will tell my story? Hmm. What if there's no story to tell? Oh, I can see it now. A 13 year old girl in Manhattan goes missing. Oh, people will cry. Say, oh, how awful. But what will be done? How will everyone remember me? 
Will they say she was asking for it? Will they tell my parents and sister to get over it years from now? Will I be forgotten before I ever have the chance to make my mark? Sincerely, one scared girl. Hey, I'm Signly and I'm 10 years old and my family hasn't been doing well because my mother hasn't got enough money to buy groceries. And my mother and I, we traveled to a protest with, with my mom about how women don't get paid the same money men get. <laughs> but um, you helped me speak to the other uh, crowd. First, I was scared. But now, I am free. Because as I look around, I see people. I sometimes get scared to call out to them. And I feel like there is something that, I, you know, I should say. But I, I can't. I feel stuck. I feel like there's something that I should add on to the people who are trying to make a difference. But I can't because I'm scared of the people. But as you said your words in a loud and proud voice to the other people, you inspired me to say without hesitation, equal pay. Yes. Discrimination, no. Equal pay, yes. Discrimination, no. Equal pay, yes. Discrimination, no. And as I chanted, I felt better of myself. I am a snowflake, a falling piece of ice, swirling down, down, down. And then I won't be, and it won't matter. The world will continue because one snowflake can't do anything because I am insignificant. I hit the ground. But it, it's not the ground. I can feel a, a, a bobbing like a wave underneath me. Up and down. Well, it's a person walking. No. Marching. I, I see a, a blue jacket. In it, an arm lifting a sign. I hear a chant over and over. No means no. All around me are people chanting in unison. You are part of that group. You, a determined young woman, you raise your head to the sky and speak for everyone to hear. You command people to hear your voice. Ah, but they won't. I know they won't. I know how people are. You are one drop in an ocean of one billion, one voice stuck in a chorus, struggling to be heard. But you keep chanting. You haven't stopped. And you never will. Your voice never falters. And the remarkable thing is that you are not alone. I look around from my seat on your blue clad shoulder. I feel like I'm on top of the world. I see voice after voice, face after face, all filled with the same defiance and hope you have. 
alone and her voice will be drowned out. But together, you will be heard. You are not a drop of water. You are a wave. And I am not a snowflake. I am a storm. Thank you for coming to hear my story. I remember the protest all those years ago as clearly as I remember the last few minutes. A cyclone of information above my understanding. A blur. It happened when I was seven, about eight years ago, when I went to my very first protest. The memory is hazy now, as you might expect, but I'm here for a reason and must wait no longer. I was holding a beautiful blue feather that was gracefully dancing in the wind, not unlike many others in the crowd. I had a good view of the place, all of the carefully crafted signs and art that could send a message that no single human could. And I was sitting atop Ma's shoulders the shouts and screams for justice, the colorful clothing, the signs, the message, all very familiar now. Yeah. But that doesn't change how the gravel crunching below our feet and the seagulls screeching as we marched on wasn't confusing. But the most confusing thing, even now as I'm speaking to all of you, it's the end, folks. The shouts had suddenly grown louder and the pace of our walking had quickened. Ma safely reunited me with the ground, took my hand and motioned for me to run. And oh, wow, I ran fast. But then, Fear taking control. I looked back. And that is when I got my first glimpse of injustice. I can't imagine what that must have been like. That's something so hard to overcome at such a young age. I'm so sorry that you had to go through all that. Wow, tell me more about your hard life. Here are some examples of what people say when they hear that I am a refugee. Or as I like to call it, the pity line. Yeah, maybe some people mean it and really take it into account and think about it or whatever, but they never actually mean it. Some people use it to learn more because they're nosy or can't wait to hear the end. The others, that small amount of people, say it because they, well, I guess, think that it makes you who you are. Not in a bad way, in a way to get to know a person, become friends with them, talk to them. But you know from the look on their face which one of these people you're talking to. Yes. I am a refugee, and everyone has a different way of thinking of a refugee. Some may think that you broke the law into getting into another country. Others think of you as someone who was poor and had to leave to find money and make a career. Although these things are true, I think some people underestimate what it takes to come here. What it feels like to not know how to swim, but only have a plastic bag as a flotation device to swim across a river. As a little boy taken away from his family. Is the world an unfair place? There is one answer to that question. Only the privileged don't know how to answer it. My story is too long and people don't care enough to listen. 
but you will. It started with me as a little boy. My parents never really had much money. We were never privileged with anything, but we made it work. My life as a kid was like a swing. It had its good moments flying high in the air or down low, sad and lonely. They say you can't get any worse than low. How about falling off a swing and never being able to get back up again? That's when I knew nothing could get worse than falling off that swing. I remember feeling my mother's hand slip out of our firm grip. They were taking her away, away from me and my future. To this day, I'll never know why. Does it keep me up at night? Do I ever think about going back? Every day. Every moment. From there, it was all the usual stuff. Struggling to find a place to sleep. No money. No food. Of course, I made some friends along the way. People who either died along the road. Maybe they didn't make it across. It's been too long. That is something that I would like to keep in the past. Too many dark memories. And yes, at such a young age, way to pity myself. After a year of traveling, breaking the laws, defying the odds, I made it. With six cents to my name, I made it. I have lived ten years in this country now. More than I ever knew my mother. I never wanted my life to turn out like this. But I made it. I made it. I wish I knew someone that I could relate to. My life would be so much different if I had someone by my side to help me. Not many people can say that. Now we are here. I want to have an education become a lawyer, and change the world for the better so people like me can have their voices be heard. I wish that everyone could understand that. We are still fighting for people to be accepted in this world of injustice. People aren't allowed in America because of where they came from. If we can start fresh, so can everyone else. How dare you, Mr. CEO, standing there on that stage with your suit and your perfect place of power and pathetically paid over people's deaths as you pretend that everything is okay. Maybe if you finally opened your eyes and take a step away from money, you could see at last that you are very wrong. Everything is not okay. Take a second to imagine Imagine that you look up in the sky one day and you see the smoke and you feel the fire. Imagine that it was you standing there as that big, bright barricade of flame comes roaring towards you. What do you think as that parade of pain comes ever closer? What can you feel as the fire engulfs you and the flame licks your flesh. After only minutes, you have fallen to the floor and all you know is fire and flame. Do you even feel the pain? Or do you just accept your fate and the fate of the world around you? The fate that you have helped to inflict upon this world because you know, like me, that no amount of power can protect you from the pollution. This has been all I have known since that fatal day 15 years ago when that big, bright, terrible ball of fire engulfed my house with my parents inside of it. The light in my mind has gone blank and it is miles too far for the sun to reach it again. And we'll have your company to thank for this. Trash in the ocean, deforestation, animals don't have their habitats, the trees are dying and fresh air is hard to find. If we don't stop now, the only thing we'll know 
is pain and pollution. And we'll have your company to thank for it. $25,000. $25,000 is what I have for this work. One full year of waking up at six in the morning, doing the same thing as all of these other damn people. What do I have to give? $25,000 is what I have. And what does he have? He got $40,000, that's what he has. He has $15,000 more than I got. What could I do with an extra $15,000? I could support my family. I could do something nice for myself for once. I wouldn't have to wake up at 6 a.m. I wouldn't need to work at this damn job that I hate. I would be equal. That's what I would be. What does my life come to? I live in a routine. Wake up, get dressed, get kids out the door, take the bus to work, work for eight damn hours alongside others who get more credit. And then I come home just to realize I am not doing enough. That who I am isn't earning me enough. That there is nothing I can do to be equal. So what am I gonna do? Am I just gonna sit here and accept this? It's like the other poor souls who ain't equal, who ain't getting paid enough. Like the people who put in the same amount of labor but still fall short. I mean, what do they think, huh? I didn't ask for this life. I didn't ask to come in second place every damn time. So what do I feel? I feel out of control. I feel like my fate is being decided for me. You know what I am? I'm being controlled. I can't change a single thing to make me equal. I am who I am. And there's not a damn thing I can do about it. So tell me why, why am I putting all of this effort just to fall short? And why is he doing the same damn thing as I'm doing, but he gets rewarded? He gets 15,000 times more than me. Now, how does that make sense? No. Oh, no. You know what I'm gonna do? Hmm? I'm going to march myself down to that evil workplace. I'm gonna take my foolish boss by the collar and say, oh boss, you must have wrote $25,000 on my paycheck instead of $40,000. <laughs> silly mistake, isn't it? Don't worry about it though. I will help you fix it. Then I'll stick a pen in his hand and make him write me a new one. I'm going to bring all of the ladies in here to do the same. And we are going to fight until we make things right. We're not going to accept 25. No, no. We're going to fight till we get a full $40,000. We're going to fight till we're equal. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. As a young black girl, I always thought that everyone was treated equally. Innocence took over me and I thought, I don't have the same skin color as everyone else, but that doesn't matter. It did. Is there something wrong with me? Your hair is so exotic and fluffy. Can I touch it? Everyone said. I wondered why nobody wanted to touch the pale girl's blonde head. 
is there something wrong with me? Why are you being so loud and aggressive? Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I'm not allowed to be expressive. Is there something wrong with me? Nobody will ever like somebody like you because no matter how I talk or how I dress, I'll always be somebody's black, unfixable mess. Is there something wrong with me? You don't act black, they proclaim, as I wonder how it's possible for a human and a color to act the same. Maybe there is something wrong with me. Since people can't see past the color that is me, and because of that, people won't let me be. There's definitely something wrong with me because I'm told to feel good about myself since what they say is untrue, but that just shows an obvious misunderstanding of the pain I have been subjected to. I'm told to brush thoughtless comments off as if they were dust on my shoulder, but I know they will only multiply as I grow older. I know I will never be the standard or what people want me to be, but if I have to change who I am, I'd rather just flee. I'm constantly informed that beauty comes from within, but I'm only told that to distract me from the injustice of my skin. But there's undeniably nothing wrong with me. My silky brown skin was formed by the gods. My hair was curled and coiled by magical odds. My chestnut eyes reflect the sun and suck people into an abyss. There are so many girls who think there is something wrong with them, even though they are just like this. And for those young girls of color who stay gracious and true, know that there is absolutely nothing wrong with you.